Good afternoon. My name is Honor Feedy, and I'm a staff person in the Professional Development Services Department at NAESP. I'd like to welcome you to this afternoon's uh, wonderful webinar that we're having uh, with Dr. Lynn Scott on Enhancing Principal Skills Through Sustainable Mentoring Programs. Today's webinar is being recorded uh, and should be available on our NAESP website uh, in 24 hours. So um, if you, in case you missed this, uh, it will be available. Um, I'd like to first um, tell you a little bit about Dr. Scott's background. Um, we are very pleased and honored to have such an experienced uh, speaker with us on this topic. Uh, Dr. Scott is a leadership development consultant who has worked uh, since 2001 um, on Principal Leadership Development Initiative for the Wallace Foundation. Um, he has an extensive background working with Wallace on numerous contributions to the Foundation's uh, support of school leadership initiatives. Uh, he's been a group facilitator for uh, Wallace's uh, leading change uh, through the learning community uh, of grant recipients and is currently one of three group facilitators of Wallace's uh, professional learning community. Uh, with that said, uh, I would like to also uh, tell you a little bit about, um, this is a one hour uh, webinar. Uh, with, in terms of handling questions, all of you are muted right now. Uh, if you would like to have a, have a question on something that uh, Dr. Scott goes over, I'd encourage you to write in uh, your question under our question box, which is located on your panel. Um, and we will get to it as soon as uh, there's a break. Uh, this is going to be kind of an um, ongoing, uh, we really encourage your dialogue, your questions, your feedback as we go through the webinar. But if there's something um, that you know, we haven't answered sufficiently, we'll be glad to uh, take your question and come back to you after the webinar is over. So with that, uh, Dr. Scott, I will turn it over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's really uh good opportunity for me to, to share uh, what I've learned about mentoring programs and, and uh, what can be done to en enhance their effectiveness and, and sustainability. But before I begin, you know, I've really been just immediately reflecting on how peculiar the, the webinar concept and technology is. On the one hand, we're, you know, we're, we're already in the future talking uh, uh, over the internet, but the webinar kind of brings us back to the 1950s uh, television era where we're looking at these rather staid screens. So uh, again, I, my attempt is to try to make this as uh, both informative and, and interactive as, as possible. Uh, when, I, when I was trying to put this together, I, I had two choices. I could have uh, designed a set of slides and some dialogue to just say, look at what we found about mentoring programs, isn't that interesting? or take the attempt, to make the attempt that I've done today, which is to really not only try to share information with you, but also a way of thinking about how to couch the, the argument for the value of mentoring. And uh, so I'll be sharing with you uh, source of data, uh, data from different sources, as well as a, really the logic that I've set up uh, that makes the most sense uh, to me. So if we could uh, go to the next slide. Uh, here's what I'd like to talk about today. First of all, as you see, make the case. How do we make the case? And many there have been a lot written about mentoring for for all kinds of leaders, but in particular for school principals. Uh, what I found over the, the ten years of, of working with Wallace and other organizations in, in this leadership area in mentoring is that when people talk about mentoring, there tends to be an assumption of, the, of its value and worth, and oftentimes that's not clear to people that are uh, other stakeholders, particularly those providing resources and, and support. So what's, how do we make the case? Next, we already know that there are mentoring programs out there, so what's the problem? What is, you know, is there a problem that, that needs to be addressed that helps us enhance the utility and the value and sustainability of mentoring programs? And as you see in the final bullet, What's the solution? How, how, do we, how do we actually create these more robust programs that are of, of value to principals, to schools, and ultimately to, to student achievement? So if we go to the next slide, this, 
graphic that I, I uh, created. It was I created it a few years ago, and it really represents uh, my my learning at the time. Uh, my background is uh, a, a long career in, in the Air Force as a behavioral scientist dealing with leadership issues, uh, organizational behavior issues. And when I started working with Wallace in 2001, this was this is I, I was just learning so much about uh, the principalship. So. What I thought about when I, when I created this slide a few years ago was how, how do we depict what the challenges are, particularly for uh, early career principles, but, but also for you know, principles in, in general. So as you see the, the title, the principalship has fundamentally changed uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, more responsibilities, more challenges. And what, what this graphic is to represent is you have this big arrow that is the theoretical arrow of performance. Someone comes out of an aspiring principles program, you would expect if they're just on that path uh, of, of growth and development and wisdom that, that they're at an optimal performance level. But the little line at the bottom represents how all these forces that inhibit this optimal performance. And, and these, these, these factors, the, the, these what inhibits the are all these new challenges, particularly when early career principals are placed in, in low performing schools, when you have more accountability. So the idea here is that immediately early, early career principals can be knocked off their game of development and have this particular uh, performance gap. And, and that can be problematic. Uh, we need to think through what if, if we, you want to have a system a system in which you develop leaders and place them in, in schools where the, after investing all of that time of selecting people at the time that they invested in developing the prerequisite skills to say, you know, within the first couple of years, we're going to still make a decision of whether or not you were the right person. The other way to look at this is to be thinking about how do we enhance the investment that has already been made through development. So, the next set of slides I'm going to show you illustrate in making this case about how do you take this recognition of, of performance gap problems and look at what some of the consequences are. So this is the, the first big takeaway in terms of some solid evidence. This, this is a study uh, done uh, just a few years ago by UCEA and the University of Texas looking at principal turnover rates. They also looked at the teacher turnover rates. and and how, uh, how the effect of both of those, what effect of both of those have on schools. And so we're going to focus right now just on the principles. And, and so the data they collect, this is based on Texas, uh, it was data that really was looking at the retention rate or the turnover, the obverse of that, the turnover rate of principles and the data ranged from, you know, 1995 through 2007. So you can, you can find these two articles. Uh, to get the more uh, more complete explanation of the study and, and the results. But I want to show you a couple of slides that get to this issue of when you have performance gaps, sometimes it leads, it can lead to turnover, and what are the consequences of that turnover. So the next slide is actually taken from a presentation that uh, one of the authors has made after the study, uh, after the completion of the study. And what, you know, very quickly, the blue, you know, blue is for elementary school principals, green for middle school principals, the amber is for high school principals. And what you're seeing is that the percentage of those principals who are staying in the same school after three years uh, in the school. And this, while, while I'll, I, will, I will acknowledge that it is possible that some of those principals have moved on to other positions in the, in the administration, one would think that, and the authors of the, the, the study think that this is more indicative of people actually leaving the position, either leaving uh, uh, of their own volition or being removed from the school because of, of, of not being able to meet the challenges. So when you look at that bar, 50%, you can see that, you know, if looking at these different uh, cohort years, that we're really not, we're not keeping, we're losing a lot of principles. At each, it's worse at the high school level than it is at middle school than it is at elementary school, but turnover is a problem. 
we go to the next slide, it's another view, and they created uh, a way, what they call a, a stability kind of view, where now we see the segments by each type of school, but tracking, you know, a cohort over, over cohorts over five-year intervals. And again, when we just, it, it's not moved, it's not in the right direction. It just isn't in the right direction. So also in preparing for this, I ran across a oh, commentary about this topic of turnover of principles. And it, I was very surprised to read some, some comments that basically represented the sink or swim philosophy. Not the development philosophy, not the investment philosophy, but the sink or swim. So the attitude was, well, gee, I guess it's good to get rid of principles that can't, can't make the grade. And that's one way to look at it. But there are some, these authors, these researchers have, have also found that there are very serious consequences to the school when you have turnover that is represented in these particular numbers. So if we, we go to the next slide, what, what did they, they find? Uh, first of all, school reform takes time. Leaders, uh, principals are leaders in the school, and they are, are, are the major agent as a, in, in, the, in an organizational effort to reform a school. That is, that is the role of organizational leaders, to move an organization, to organize and motivate people, to find synergies that can allow an organization to achieve its objectives. So school reform takes time, and if the leader is constantly being cycled out, for any number of reasons, that reform will be inhibited. Next, as you see in the second bullet, when you have high turnover of principles, it negatively affects teacher retention, teacher quality, and student achievement. Now we're, now we're moving down to the operational level of, of the school and the ultimate outcome that's supposed to come from the school, student achievement, when you have high principal turnover. And then the last bullet, just what, what is it that, that school leaders do, the principals do? They, they provide, they are an important element, a very critical element in developing trusting relationships among staff and students, more positive working condition, all of which they say are, are major contributors to teacher retention. So, so in, in this attempt of saying, can, can you make the case? First, this case is, first of all, we think that there are, we, there are serious performance decrements that can occur, can occur for early career principals when they're, they're put in challenging schools. And there are, with these performance decrements, that contributes, can contribute to turnover, and turnover leads to these particular kinds of outcomes. So, next slide, we go back to the graphic. And in my mind, when I, when I created this graphic, I saw mentoring is as as a very effective intervention that would bring people, would, would, de would eliminate that performance gap, that would be a, a way of getting people back on their game to optimal performance. And particularly, if you focus mentoring efforts for early career principals, then, then those tend to be the people who need it the most, and they, they have the better chance of actually having a full career in, in the principalship, to be a member, a full member of the profession. So, so when I, I made this, this graphic some years ago, uh, it, it was followed by the next slide, and it was a very encouraging slide. It, it really talked about where, where, is the, where are we as a nation on, uh, with mentoring. And basically, it's a good news story. It's such a good news story that you might want to end the, end the, the presentation on it. Uh, Honor, could you go to the next slide, please? Thanks. So, roughly half of the nation's states have adopted mentoring requirements for new principals. Fantastic. Some mentoring is now required. Sometimes some of the, you know, it's mandated by, from the legislature. Not often it isn't funded, but it's mandated. Heightened appreciation of an understanding of the critical roles, roles school leaders can play, and, and more tools and research are available to help make mentoring programs successful. We also knew at that time, this is about five years ago, if you go to the next slide, that people were recognizing that mentoring should be seen as a skill-building intervention. 
mentoring was not supposed to be a buddy system. Mentoring was not supposed to be uh, really, I guess, anything but a developmental intervention, which really to enhance someone's performance. So, so if this was five years ago, this would be the end of the presentation. You'd say, well, go off and do wonderful things. However, the drama began, you know, around five years ago as more and more people were using mentoring or attempting to put together mentoring programs. It led to a discovery that uh, is, it moves us to the, the project I've just finished doing with the Wallace Foundation. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, the problem is that when a number of existing mentoring programs were, were just reviewed for a while, basically, how are you doing? It, it, it was found that there was wide variety in their quality. And, and, and wide variety in the likelihood for their sustainability beyond the next five years. That, that posed a very serious problem. So uh, the, the most recent work that I've been doing with the Wallace uh, Professional Learning Communities with its most recent set of uh, grant recipients, we had a particular group focused on mentoring. And we decided that we should collect data and, 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 and discern from that data what can be done to improve the quality and increase the sustainability of, of mentoring programs. So let's see. I'm, I'm pausing for a second because I'm also looking at the chat to make sure I don't get carried away and don't miss any, any questions. So let's, let, me, let me tell you about this project because it, it, it actually is very exciting and, and very, very informative to get to the, well, what's wrong with current mentoring programs with regard to sustainability, with regard to quality issues. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. All right, so let me tell you what, where we got this data. Um, we were able to conduct a national survey. Uh, we were using uh, membership rosters from uh, SREB uh, as well as Learning Forward. And so uh, we were directed, you know, the recipients were at the, the school district level. Uh, and what you, you see is that we were able, because we're just sending these surveys out to individuals, we're actually able to get data from, uh, from uh, either superintendents or district staff members that had mentoring programs, but also we were able to gather data about their, uh, the views of, of, uh, of, of these administrators uh, from districts that did not have mentoring programs. Uh, in total, 218 responses where we had at least one, one district uh, across 40 states. And then we had, as you see on the right, interviews. So we wanted to interview uh, uh, past recipients of Wallace Foundation grants who had mentoring programs, as well as we had a number of other programs in the country that had not been funded by Wallace so that we could, you know, not, we weren't influenced by the, the effect of the Wallace Foundation, uh, you know, how they work with their grantees. And then we were also able to get input, as you see in that third bullet, from uh, program coordinators from three leading corporations. And, and these are, we're not going to, I can't tell you the names, so I can tell you they are household, they're household names and leaders in their particular industry sector. So you see the total number of interviews that we had uh, across nine states, three industry sectors. So then the group taking all this data then deliberated over the data to try to find out what they we thought were the enablers and the barriers to sustainable mentoring programs. Dr. Scott, um, I have a question for you um, regarding um, the uh, mentoring programs. Were they all district-based, or did you have any from universities or charter schools, or was there a variety of uh, type of mentoring programs? Some are, uh, many are district-based, uh, some are, are state-based. Uh, uh, I'm, 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 I'm trying to go through my mind very quickly because we had a question that, that, that asked, you know, where, where, at what level it was organized. Yeah. And I don't think there, there might have been one or two respondents from charter schools, uh, but the majority were either a school district level uh, or it was a, a state organized uh, mentoring program. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So let's, uh, let's find out what we learned. We can go to the next slide. Here's this. First of all, this is the structure of the survey 
as well as the interview protocol. We had to have, if you will, a model, a generic model of a mentoring program from which we could then structure our questions to find out whether or not you know, these attributes existed uh, and, and what relationship they might have to uh, sustainability. So this is, this, is not, this is not a magic kind of model. It's just kind of a basic model that you would think about, about uh, an education or training system. You have to have an organizational component. The mentor cadre simply means you have people that are imparting this, this training or knowledge or education. You, you, you have to train those trainers or educators. That's the mentor training column. And then you should have a systematic way of assigning the mentors to the mentees or the principals. And then there should be an evaluation component. And you can see the bullets within each column. We had questions that addressed each one of those those areas in each one of those columns. So, and the interview, as I said, the interview protocols operated in the same way so that we had a parallelism. We could take advantage of quantitative data to see amount and, and frequent, frequency or, and, and patterns, but by asking the same questions in an interview format, we had a lot of depth of, of, of knowledge on this particular areas as well. So let's go to the next slide. The first thing that was really surprising to me, now remember I showed you a slide a little while ago that said, well, five years ago we were saying, look, how many states had uh, said mentoring was important and how many legislatures had mandated that they exist. Granted, this is just over 200 responses, uh, but I was surprised to find that uh, only 41% of the survey respondents said they had an active mentoring program. All right, now of those that did have the program, you see here, 21% of them were not funded, 24 did not, uh, did not assess the mentor's performance, 26% of, of the programs dedicate funds to program evaluation, 32% did not expect, expect to even have the resources to go over the next, for the next five years. And again, this wide variation in program designs and administration approaches that we learned from questions that ask them to describe their programs. So just off the top, there, there to me is a surprise. When one, one reads in, in other, other publications how widespread and, and how everyone takes is taken on the banner of, of mentoring, yet this rather small survey um, says may, may not be as, as prevalent as, as we think. And more importantly, that 21% of the programs were not funded. But that, that means they're taking it out of hide. They are not paying for training. They are not paying stipends for mentors. In many cases, they are using mentors who are sitting principals. And so now we're asking people who are already busy to be busier and to try to find time to help somebody with their performance gap. That's laudable when people want to do it, but it's also an approach that can threaten the sustainability when, when sitting principals say, I, I just can't do this. I, I've got to take care of my own school. So that was the first surprise that hmm, uh, things may for not many not as many are using it using mentoring and those that are may not be really designing and operating the program that, that can contribute to sustainability. So what's the what's the next thing we found? Let's go to the, the next slide. Now what about those who did not have a mentoring program? we asked what factors would, would affect their, a creation of a program. And as you can see the, the bullets there, uh, they wouldn't be able to establish one because they didn't have the necessary financial resources. Uh, just over half said if they established a program, they would not have the necessary resources to sustain it for five years. And 45% uh, envisioned they would dedicate funds to program evaluation. That last bullet I, I, I put on the slide because that was that caught my attention, where the previous slide showed a much smaller percentage of actual uh, programs devoting money to evaluation. Those who envision programs, uh, a higher percentage said that they would. This issue of evaluation is extremely, extremely important, particularly in the area of, of, of assessing utility, uh, effectiveness, and being able to make the case to stakeholders about the value of this particular form of intervention. So moving on to the next slide, we wanted to know 
we had a portion of the survey, as well as the interview, but we're just looking at survey data now. We wanted to know what, if you were going to create a program or, or have, if you're going to have a program, what should, what should its components be? What should the most absolutely critical or important components be in structuring a program? Now, we define critical as uh, if, if, you didn't, if, if you didn't have this particular feature, the program would fail. It would be, we were asked people to check a component uh, as being important if it provided a supporting uh, role or it was, it, it was support, it supported the critical element. And then we had uh, useful, which was an enhancement. And then we had an opportunity for people to say it, it was not, of no value at all. So what you see on the left and the right are on the left hand side were the responses for uh, uh, folks that, that, that had mentoring programs. And on the right were responses for those respondents that were envisioning programs. The, the big, the, what's the big picture in all these words? They're essentially identifying the same elements. A little bit of difference in terms of numbers and, and percent, you know, percents, but in terms of saying, if, if one were to ask, well, what would I need to have if I wanted to create, you know, a, a good mentoring program? Well, you, you need to have somebody who's going to be an administrator uh, or, or staff for the program. You just can't let this thing float on its own. Uh, I, I, you need to have the endorsement of key stakeholders. You need to identify those stakeholders, and you need to have their very active endorsement for its importance and its continuation. Evaluation, evaluation, evaluation. The last three bullets are all about evaluation. So being able to understand how that program is, the mentor program actually is connected to the principal's development goals. How, how are your mentors doing? If you, you, it's laudable that people volunteer to be mentors, to, to, to dedicate that time and effort. But if you haven't evaluated whether they're being effective, it's, it's on faith. And that doesn't help the principal who's receiving the mentoring if it hasn't, isn't going well. And it doesn't help the overall sustainability for the program. And then this last bullet about the summative assessment of principal's growth as instructional leaders, that, that takes us right to the role of the leader in the school in enhancing the, the, the school as an organization and, and their role in, in student achievement. So we're like, taking a much more comprehensive view about evaluation we were when we designed the questionnaire and the interviews, and it appears that the respondents also were indicating a similar type of comprehensiveness in terms of evaluation. So let's go to the next slide. And the interviews were really, really interesting, uh, particularly because we were we didn't we didn't pick deliberately pick winners. We didn't deliberately pick everybody who was successful. We had some that were more successful than others with their programs. But when we focused on those that had sustainable programs, here's, these bullets highlight really the additional things, the, the, the enhancements that they put on the basic model that seem to really contribute to sustainability. So having a rigorous process for recruiting and selecting mentors, not just asking for volunteers, but really vetting those who, who raise their hand to say, I'd like to do this. So now you've, when you're doing that, you've, you, you've targeted who you would like to apply, and you have some selection criteria set out for the attributes that you want your mentors to have. Next, this very formal process. There are many ways in which you can uh, uh, establish a, a, a matching uh, protocol, whether that is strength to weakness, whether that is in a temperament type of match, whether that is uh, someone who uh, the mentor may have had experience in the same level or type of school as the mentee. There are many ways to do it, but matching is important. It's really, I was excited to learn about a number of programs that treat their mentor cadre as a learning community and provide opportunities for their interaction in learning and development. So this, uh, this concept of professional development for the mentor cadre being just as important as mentoring is for the professional development of the, the principal. 
And then there are a few programs that now have their mentors doing more than just mentoring. Their mentors are more integrated into the professional development strategy and programs for school administrators. And so it enhances the mentor's knowledge of the complexities that the, the, of the district or the state. And it allows them, in many cases, to have greater credibility with not only the principals that they mentor, but the stakeholders as well. So that was, uh, that was exciting. There are, there are some great programs out there, and there's, it's, important to, it's important to find them, highlight them, so that others who, who want to enhance their programs can actually learn from what they've done. So, uh, Lynn, Lynn, if I yes. could interrupt for just a minute, I had that, so just, these findings are incredible. I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, when, you, when you saw the processes for recruiting and selecting mentors, did you see a lot of variability or were there some common themes for, for you know, what should be uh, recruit, you know, what would be a good uh, recruiting or selecting, you know, uh, procedures? I mean, was, was it all over the board or were there so I, You know, I, I can't. I really can't answer that specifically, oh. okay. I'll give, but I'll give you an example. And this is an example of a program that actually was not, not in our study, this, but I know about the program. If you go to New Jersey's uh, Leaders to Leaders uh, 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 website, that is the site for their mentoring program. And it's kind of clear, they're, they're, pretty, they're very particular. Um, they have a very structured application form. They communicate that they're going to select. And so I think, I think just in general, following the, the sound rules for selection and uh, recruiting and selecting people of a, uh, who perform particular skills, is that, that's a prudent way to do it. So let's think back to what's the purpose. You're serving the needs of a principal, um, the developmental needs of a principal. So first, examining what that need set is for the principal, and then asking yourself what kinds of people, what are the attributes of, of, of people that I need to look for who can best meet that need after they've received the training that I'm going to give them in being a mentor. So uh, uh, one, to piggyback on this example, let's go back to my comment about programs that use sitting principals. If you find that your uh, uh, principal population that you want to receive mentoring is a population that will need a lot of time because of the challenges that they face. Relying on sitting principals to provide the mentoring might, might fall short of the goal. They just might not have the time. Relying on retired principals who may have, may have more time might be an attribute. So time, availability is, is, a, is an important selection criterion. And retired principals might be uh, a, a ready recruiting source in order to meet that particular need. So you really need to look at the, the particular group of uh, mentees and what their needs are first, don't you, to, to, to make that recruiting and selecting work? A absolutely. The focus, the focus is on, on the mentee. What, what, because now we're we're, we're concerned about their performance. We're concerned about their development. So everything that you build in your program is dedicated to making that happen, enhanced performance, contributing to development, instead of simply saying, I think we have a good mentoring program because 25 people signed up to be mentors. That's wonderful. Yes, I, I agree with you totally. That's wonderful. Thank you. Sure. So let's see. Uh, we talked about the, the, the interviews with the schools, but we had, let's talk about, I was going to talk about the, men, the, the interviews with, uh, with corp, corporations, but let's see, let's, let, let's be surprised. What's the next slide show? Yes, what did we find from industry? All right, industry is always fascinating to me when compared to the public sector, uh, and because so much of the, so much it really is driven by the bottom line. And, and, and this is an example of a positive feature being driven by the bottom line. Those companies we interviewed, they had different levels of sophistication about 
their, uh, for their mentoring programs. But what they were concerned about was enhancing the, their, their employees' abilities so that they could further the objectives of the company. All right, so you see the first bullet, mentoring programs are tied to a company culture of sustained investment in the workforce. The, the attitude is not, we hired you, but we're not sure, and we're going to use your job as an opportunity to determine if we made a good decision or not. The attitude is we hired you, we had a very rigorous hiring process, and now we, we want this program to ensure that you are going to add value to the organization. So having a company, having an organizational culture, now it's, we can say a school district culture, a State Department of Education culture, a school culture that is centered on an investment in people makes it a lot easier to support a mentoring program. And I, I can't think of a better environment that should embody that, that, that philosophy than a school. Uh, since we're investing in the development of children, we should continue that philosophy and expand it with the staff. So next, mentoring programs develop employees' performance in alignment with business strategy and business practices. How does that translate to what we're talking about here? It, it translates to the, the, the strategic plan of the district, the, the plan of the principal and the teaching staff to, to accomplish their particular goals. So that goes back to, well, who should I choose as a mentor? Choose mentors and have mentor training and a mentoring program that helps the principal achieve the strategy and, and, the, and the practice of, of, of education. And then, as you've read already, mentoring programs evolve based on program assessments, experience, company needs, and employee needs. There, you, you just can't say, we've got a program. I guess it'll work out fine. Uh, this gets right back to the evaluation. It gets right back to making, being really in touch with what principals are confronting in their, in their role, in their schools, and being able to say, let's make sure that this developmental intervention does all it can to eliminate uh, a performance gap. So let's, let, me, let me shift now. I want to go to the next slide because what it allowed us, uh, what I want, what it, 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 we're transitioning from, you know, we've talked about some problems. Uh, we've talked about what we found as, uh, as, as in an exemplar uh, form in terms of the, through the interviews. But we also had another part of the survey that wanted the respondents to tell us about, uh, in essence, could you identify for us the unique attributes of mentoring? What, what gave it, a di what distinguished is it, it mentoring as, as, a, as an, uh, in its value when compared to other forms of development? And the other forms of development were traditional professional development programs and um, job embedded professional learning communities. So we know that people go to traditional off-site training. Uh, we know that uh, professional learning communities are growing. So, you know, in essence, the hypothesis was that, you know, we, we uh, the null hypothesis is that there's no difference. Uh, it, somehow mentoring is just like one of the other two. Uh, what we were hoping to find is there's something that actually could be rather specific about mentoring that would allow you to say, let's go with mentoring or let's mix it in a way with these other two forms. So let's go to the, let's see what the survey says. All right, now on the left, let's just focus on the left-hand side. These are the features that, that where mentoring programs have distinct value over the other two as indicated by our survey respondents, meaning they had high hits in terms of you know being you know being distinct. Um, so providing mentoring pro and and so these are our talking points. When someone says why should we do any mentoring? I mean there's all the kinds of stuff out there to help people uh, you know improve their performance. Well, mentoring provides principals with strategies to confront specific needs of schools. You don't have that when you go to a traditional. Uh, uh, professional development. It's, it's a generic or generalized type of presentation. It, the presenter isn't talking about your school. The mentor can. It offers, mentoring offers principals with expertise that can accelerate their development. If you've done a good job so recruiting and selecting mentors, training them, matching them, now that principal has somebody that can really 
zoom in on what the critical issues are that they're facing, what the root causes might be, and offers, offer strategies or ways of thinking through the problem that can accelerate their development. Tied to that is the third bullet. The content is share, shared during mentoring is linked to the strengths and weaknesses of the principal. It's not the case in, in terms of, of other forms of, of development where it can be so closely linked, so personally linked to strengths and weaknesses. And the last bullet you've already read, mentoring is responsive to principal's learning and development needs. So th those five, those, those four areas, are, are where programs have distinct value. Now, the column on the right, we wanted to illustrate, we wanted to find out, and, and we did, and we were illustrating where the biggest difference is between mentoring and traditional um, uh, off-site training and development. So you, you see that, again, mentoring is head and shoulders above traditional development on points one, contents linked to strengths and weaknesses, and number two, ensures the principals use what they learn to improve their leadership and teaching effectiveness. What, I, what that bullet means is that when you have a mentor, the mentor can come back and say, how did that go? How, how did that work that we talked about you doing? How, did, how is that improving? Is it improving? What do we need to do to make it improve? So you, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to let you, I'm going to let a couple seconds go by to, to let you finish reading what's on, on this right column so that when in the, you know, or write it down, so that when someone says, if you're an advocate for mentoring programs, you say, well, someone says, I like the old method better. Well, there are five areas where these survey respondents were able to, based on their responses, really show, you know, gave much more higher marks to mentoring over, over traditional development. So let's see how it compares to uh, professional learning communities. Let's go to the next slide. So the Items on the left column are the same as what you saw on the previous slide. This is where mentoring programs offer distinct value. But now, what we're showing on the right-hand column are areas where mentoring has a lot in common with job-embedded professional learning communities. And you see that this is where the difference in the re uh, responses was less than or equal to 2%. So they're almost the same in terms of availability of fit principal schedules, almost the same in offering a geographically close form of development, uh, the same in customization, almost the same in ensuring principals use what they learn to improve their leadership and teaching effectiveness, and almost the same in providing principals with the strategies to confront specific needs of their schools. So where the, where the professional learning community, what it, where it took this data in our deliberations was that Ah, this may be an issue when we combine this slide and the previous one. This may be an issue of, 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 of integration, meaning that this wasn't an attempt to demonize the other two forms. This was an attempt to understand where mentoring fell with the other two forms. And so this thinking it through in terms of a more of a system of development, there may be certain principles there may be principles in certain types of schools. There may be certain types of issues that, that principals face that lend themselves very well to mentoring, whereas other forms of other principals or problems or schools or districts may, may find that, well, professional learning communities or traditional methods are more appropriate. Some even have the idea that you could sequence them so that early career principals, for example, in their in initial years would have mentoring and then they would transition to professional learning communities. And there would be a selection of what would be appropriate for offsite training. So this this these data open possibilities of how one can integrate mentoring into the total package of professional development uh, uh, professional development. And, and we, we also believe that that strategy could be very conducive to sustainability because now mentoring isn't this low-hanging fruit for its budget to be cut because it's just out there versus, well, it's part of our integrated strategy for development. So let's go to the next slide. So we're back to our pillars. We want to use this as an organizing uh, uh, image to 
when I first showed it to you, it was to set up you know, the types of questions that we asked in the survey. Now it's set up in the same way to highlight what we found from the data in our deliberations to be the barriers to sustainability. So I want to take a little time with this. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be the worst radio announcer and, and just kind of go each, over each one of these points here. Poor organization. We have evidence from the survey as well as the interviews of cases of an absence of clear vision or goals for mentoring. An issue here in the next one, overestimation of program requirements. Sometimes people overthought the problem, which gets to the what, what you know, the data we collected in terms of what's critical and what's important and what's useful. You don't have to have the, the Bentley version of mentoring to get a mentoring program, an effective one, going. It's important that, that when you start a program or you're looking at your current program to ensure that it has the most important elements. I made a point already about this next one, lack of integration with other professional learning programs. If it's hanging out there by itself, the money's just going to go. It, it's, in these times, it's very hard to support something unless you have overwhelming data. Uh, absence of funding and resources. Uh, something I didn't show, show you was that we asked people a question to, to identify where their major funding categories either were or what they envisioned to be the major funding categories. For a program, and one of the responses was uh, either dedicating, uh, you know, uh, a person's time or or other forms of resources to get money, communication efforts to raise funding, advocacy. Very few current programs from our respondents are dedicating any time or money to get money, so that's a problem. Low stakeholder commitment, uh, and that that's that's hand in glove. You know, if you aren't advocating for money, then you probably aren't advocating with stakeholders uh, to, to get what you need for your program. So next column, mentor cadre with, with time constraints. When you overuse sitting principles, you're really undercutting your program. And so uh, there, are other, there are other, as we put there, whether they're retired principles or if your training is robust enough, make an appeal to uh, community leaders to say, we'll, we will train you to be an effective mentor to an instructional leader. We will give you that training. And what we want from you is the time and the engagement to, to be a mentor at, to this leader. So there are other sources beyond sitting principles. Um, sometimes the training hey, is not. Uh, could I ask yes. a question on the funding? Um, in your um, extensive knowledge, I mean, do you know if our states and districts, um, you know, with the whole Common Core state standards and stuff, are they starting to think about resources and mentoring that might be put aside in this area, or is this still, you know, an issue? It, it, it's still an issue, um, I, I, because I think that there hasn't, uh, there's, there wasn't a lot of evidence from our survey, and, and even with talking to people, you know, who have mentoring program coordinators, Many of them are saying, I don't know if I'm going to, where the money's coming from. There are some examples where, uh, for example, in the state of Alaska, and this, that was a state that was not in our, our study, but I know from talking to the program coordinator, they're a line item in the governor's budget. You know, the program, is, it, the program has survived for many, many years. Uh, it has never experienced a funding cut. He admitted that they, they could use a raise, they could use a budget increase, but they are able to demonstrate value so that it is in the governor's budget and it stays there. So there needs to be a much more uh, aggressive uh, recruitment of stakeholders. Getting back to you have to make the case. You have to build the convincing program. And you have to begin collecting data that represents the need. And after you get the program going, or if you have one, you're collecting data to show its value. So someone says, you know, I think we need to fund this. So it's still an issue. Um, so, training, it's interesting how, how in some cases very little training is, is provided. Uh, if you're not, and again, very, very little rigorous matching um, seems to be uh, a problem, and, and it's, it's extra work. If you, it goes back to if you don't have an administrator, you do not have a strong staff, you've just given an administrator uh, the fifth job for them to do, it's under, understandable that maybe there isn't time or money for 
uh, funding training. Maybe there isn't time to come up with a more robust uh, matching process. The last one, uh, this, is, this, is the, uh, uh, this is the fatal blow, limited or no evaluation. Uh, this, you have to show value. And effective programs do, uh, both in, in, amongst, uh, in the education sector as, as in, in industry. So you'll notice the points here that we're raising about where you need to be developing you know, these evaluation measures. Uh, so that you're reporting a very, if, if here's the re, one of the reasons from uh, an operational standpoint, evaluation is important. If you find that something isn't working, you have a means to analyze why. If I've evaluated mentor training, if I've evaluated mentor selection, if I've evaluated mentor assignments, if I've evaluated principal development and have a way of connecting those together, if I don't see the gains that I can ex I'm expecting, I have a way of auditing back where the, the flaw might be in the process. Uh, without it, someone just says, I guess this just didn't work, and, and then it's gone. Okay, next slide, please. Um, also, you know, in thinking about this whole issue of uh, principle of evaluation, this might be, um, maybe this would be something that, you know, the Wallace Foundation would consider, you know, uh, pushing forward is more effective mentoring. Any well, I think, uh, well, I do. I, I, it's where it, it has its value is, um, first of all, when you have an evaluation system, you've already identified performance objectives for principals or anyone in getting an evaluation. So now it, it, you may find that there are a subset of those uh, uh, evaluation areas that are very conducive to mentoring, particularly for early career principals. And so you, your development is already happening. You don't use the evaluation as the surprise at the end of the year. You use the evaluation to say, this, this is the capacity we're building towards. And if you still find that a person, a principal, is, is, is deficient after the evaluation, you now have, as well, another area that to focus where appropriate your mentoring. You could also have professional learning communities, but I'm talking about mentoring today. The point is, how do you use an evaluation system to tie it to development? Using an evaluation system to tie it to enhanced capacity, not how people tend to think about evaluation systems, which is how to, how to you know, blast somebody. Uh, it's always about bad news instead of saying, you know what, you know, Tiger Woods, you know, has somebody evaluating his swing, and then after it's evaluated, they start working on ways to improve it. So, last slide, N next to last slide. W what do we conclude? This, this is what all of you have patiently been waiting for. The final slide that says, well, what is it? What, what leads to sustainable mentoring programs? All right, well, you've probably been able to put it together. It's almost the opposite of what you saw in the previous slide. So get somebody who's dedicated to be an administrator on this. Uh, it's too complicated and also too important to, to left on its own, be left on its own. Uh, you have to aggressively go for ongoing funding, and there are some innovative ways in which to, to get the funding. Uh, there are some uh, programs that have found uh, that they can use, oh, I just can't remember which title funding, but uh, it was a novel use of a, a particular title funds funding source that would pay for mentoring. Um, the, an accountability process. Somebody has to be able to say, look, I'm depending on you to make this program work. Now, this last, this next one, legitimacy through policies and laws, we, we kind of grade that out because we, we determined from the data that you don't need to lead the charge to get a legislature to pass a law that there's going to be mentoring. You, you know, that's almost, if that happens, it's great, but it's not uh, a precursor, necessary, you know, prerequisite to move forward. You can build your program and get that later. But, and then, because what do you have? Active stakeholder engagement. So, uh, you know, I, I've, I'm, I'm talking and, and you're, you're reading faster than I can talk. Uh, you, you see where, how, how from the data and our deliberations, these, these features, 
there's formality in the features. There's there's it's it's a much more comprehensive approach to designing a program, to operating a program. There's a pr tremendous emphasis placed on who you are training, choosing as mentors, and what skills you give them. And and then we go all the way to the right. Uh, have this have this evaluation grounded in a professional learning system. Have it focused on principles development. You're, you're not just saying, asking principles, well, how would you like your mentor? You really have to get to specific behavior change. Did, did this interaction with the mentor cause you to, one, think differently about your performance as an instructional leader? Did it motivate to change your behavior as an instructional leader? Did you change it? And can we see, uh, can we actually see the results of that changed behavior? And do we see in a, in a continuous engagement with the, the mentor to ensure that all those things I just said happen and to make adjustments when they don't? Uh, when we look at the other aspects of the evaluation, do we see that that dedicated administrator is seeing that, wait a minute, I have a problem with my assignments. We're miss, we're, we have to do a better job of matching mentee to mentor to achieve the, the larger program goals that we want. When you, when you have this type of evidence, you're gathering this type of evidence. Uh, the group, the professional learning community, concluded that you have a better, first of all, you have a better program. But most importantly, since this was an issue of also about sustainability, you have a better chance of being that line item in the governor's budget, figuratively speaking. You have an understanding by stakeholders of the need of, its, of mentoring's value and confidence that the program that's being created is going to ultimately accomplish the ends that, that, that everyone wants, was, which is enhanced student achievement, better schools and enhanced student achievement. We, that's really why we're doing all this. We're not, we're not even just starting. We're not just saying, we're just doing this so we can have a development program. You're having a development program so that you can enhance schools, and then the leader can have an influence on student achievement. That's that's the kind of the big picture of, of, of mentoring programs and sustainability. So let's go to the last slide. We NASP is is now building uh, an establishing an initiative to to build sustainable mentoring programs uh, that are tied to performance. Uh, its early career supports mentoring program is going to. to and you see there, already leverage what NASP has created many years ago, a mentor certification program. So it's going to offer, continue to offer that training, offer enhanced training uh, in, in other techniques to the mentor cadre, uh, and provide this, establish this network of total educational support for the early career principal. You can't have experience principals if the early career principals are leaving. All right, so. Its goal is to establish a sustainable mentoring program that's governed, that's governed by early career principles, development needs, and program evaluation. It's kind of the, what, how I've been stomping my foot all through this presentation. What are the needs, development needs of principles in, in the interest of, of being instructional leaders, and how am I gathering data to find out that this program is actually answering those needs and providing that outcome? And this is all going to be done through state affiliates. Uh, they, they will be the, the operational arm to you know, work with districts and other forms of schools to uh, um, uh, develop the cadre, train the cadre, the mentor matching the entire model. And as you see the contact information below for uh, uh, Chris Mason um, to, to get more information about the other career supports program. So that's, that's the webinar. I, I hope that uh, I, I fulfilled what I, I said I'd hope to fulfill at the beginning, give you some information, some framework, uh, a way of thinking about it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lynn. This has been a great, uh, great webinar. I'd like to open it up. Uh, if there's any questions that you might have of Dr. Scott, now's the time to answer it. It sounds like this study has just produced wonderful results for improving mentoring programs. Um, plus, I think we're really excited to see this, this uh, NAESP initiative uh, going forward for early career uh, principals. I, I don't think there has been much uh, support for early career principals, and um, this is, I'm very excited to, you know, to continue to see how this develops. Are